Greetings, and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt, as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a wonderful little poem, an old man's thought of school. This is poem number 33 of the 38 of Autumn Rivulets. Um, by the way, the old man being referenced here is Whitman himself. The poem, the, the, the poem was read uh, October 31, 1874. We'll hear more about this from our Nortons in a second. Um, Whitman in 1874 was uh, 54, 55, 56, going on 56. Uh, so, I don't know. I mean, I guess uh, we can decide whether that's in fact an old man or not. We're going to enjoy this, but let's just point out we are back to... Whitman as Pedagogue, one of those five Ps that we talked about in earlier lectures, and of course, Song of Myself, Passage 4647, I know I have the best of time and space, it was never measured and never will be measured, I tramp a perpetual journey, come listen all, he most honors my style, who learns under it to destroy the teacher. That passage, um, of course, our assumptions are that you have been studying with us from the very beginning, I mean, if you haven't, that's fine, but it would be of great benefit, I think, to place this poem in the deathbed edition of Lisa Grass, where it sits, after having come with us at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, our playlist, from the very beginning, invitation word come, all the way up to and including a set of introductory comments for Autumn Rivulets, and we just finished with Ox Tamer, which in some ways has been read as a text about pedagogy and learning and student relationships to teachers. Now, our Nortons will tell us that this poem uh, is one that was first published in the New York Daily Graphic, November 3rd, 1874, with the head note, quote, The following poem was recited personally by the author Saturday afternoon, October 31, at the inauguration of the fine new Cooper Public School, Camden, New Jersey, end quote. Collected into Revulets of 1876, somewhat improved by the omission of three rather prosy lines in the final stanza, and then finally included in Lisa Grass, 1881. Now, there is a lot that has been said by scholars about Quakerism and the influence of Quakerism on Whitman, specifically as it relates to this poem, because he mentions the great George Fox. Um, now, there's a, it's, it's interesting to study the way in which the, the Quaker thinkers influenced Whitman and his view of education, among any number of other things. For example, in a letter to his mother, he, he, he commenting on Elias Hicks, the great, the great Quaker uh, thinker, he said that he, uh, he, he expected his mother to understand that he himself, like Hicks, would minister to the world's needs out of love rather than out of money, as if he, he was talking in the letter specifically about taking care of young men during his uh, nursing uh, experience in, in the war, and we commented on that already during our study of, of drum tabs. Um, now, the other interesting thing about Whitman's own biography is that he didn't spend much time in public schools. He was only there for about five years before he pulled out to have to help his father, who was uh, in, involved in all kinds of carpentry work and the like. So it's, it's fascinating. Whitman's own education is fascinating. You'll maybe remember as well that in uh, Song of Myself, Passage 47, he did say this, No shuttered room or school can commune with me, but roughs and little children better than they. I find that a great way to set up our reading of this wonderful little poem um, as an old man thinks of school. And again, old man here, Song of Myself uh, 43, you can go back and, and run that one to crown. And you'll remember that he does word, use the word school in Song of Myself Passage 1, creeds and schools and abeyance, you'll remember. And of course we just read from Passage 47 of Song of Myself. Again, for the inauguration of a public school, right, Camden, New Jersey, 1874. And again, Whitman, roughly 55 years old when he, when he does this presentation of the, of, the, of the old man. An old man's thought of school, an old man gathering youthful memories and blooms that youth itself cannot. Now only do I know you, O oh, fair royal skies, O oh, morning dew upon the grass. And these I see, these sparkling eyes, these stores of mystic meaning, these young lives, building, equipping like a fleet of ships, immortal ships, soon to sail out over the measureless seas on the soul's voyage. Only a lot of boys and girls, only the tiresome spelling, writing, ciphering classes, only a public school, 
Ah, oh, more. Infinitely more. As George Fox raised his warning cry, it is it this pile of brick and mortar, these dead floors, windows, rails, you call the church? Why, this is not the church at all. The church is living, ever living souls. And you, America, cast you the real reckoning for your present, the lights and shadows of your future, good or evil, to girlhood, boyhood look, the teacher, and the school. Now, I have made the argument in any number of these lectures together with you that you cannot read Leaves of Grass without appreciating the fact that Whitman was an educator, he was a teacher, and he loved education, he loved schools, and he loved the project of education in schools. And I think he understood that at the very heart of the democratic experiment lies, as he calls it, the teacher and the school. With that in mind, let's go to work now with this poem quickly. Notice he'll begin with a thought of school, in other words, consideration of school. And we're not unfamiliar with this use of the word thought, even, of course, by the roadside several times it got used. An old man gathering youthful memories. This is fun, like in a collection of poems called Leaves of Grass, to kind of gather, to collect. And, and, and it takes us back, of course, to Song of Myself, Passage 6, when a young child walks up to him with grass in his hand and asks, what is this? And he answers, how could I answer any more than, how would I know any more than, than the child? Memories and blooms makes us smile. I've said this to you guys. I think Whitman is having so much fun in Leaves of Grass in these poems as he's smiling as he's writing these and, of course, delivering this set of lines. That youth itself cannot. In other words, there's things that you can only understand after the fact. After you have gotten older, do you understand, for example, the influence of a great teacher maybe in your life or the value of a school in your life. Now only... Do I know you? This interesting phraseology of the I know you, you'll remember from a site in camp at daybreak when he said, young man, I think I know you. This idea of knowledge and who knows. Oh, fair auroral skies. And again, now this is brilliant stuff. Back to our star and the use of the star as a symbol. Oh, morning dew upon the grass. And of course, I told you guys this idea of the way in which he uses the word grass. And it takes us back to Song of Myself, Passage 6, an educational passage, as we commented on it when we, when we met it. And these I see, and, and again, this ability to, to comment on what it is that I see takes us back to Brooklyn Ferry, doesn't it? These sparkling eyes, go back and look at Sparkling Wheel and, and, and see how that is also a text where he's standing with children, watching the sparks. And again, it's not just a poem about inspiration, is it? it's a poem about education, which, of course, in the, same, in the end, is the same thing, as Whitman would argue. These stores of mystic meaning, notice the, the, the building with the M sounds, these stores of mystic meaning, these young lives, earlier they're blooms, now they're young lives, building, equipping, and then using a word picture that lifted right out of Virgil's Aeneid, if you will, right? Um, a, a, a powerful simile. Building, equipping, like a fleet of ships, immortal ships, which takes us, of course, back to, oh, captain, my captain, and any number of other places. But the ship of state, we'll remind ourselves, is a, an idea built where, for the first time, Plato's Republic, and we've given full lectures on Plato's Republic at LearnStrong.net, of course, Plato's Republic 5, what then shall be your education? We've made the argument that that set of lectures is fundamentally about what? Education, right? So here we go. Ships, immortal ships, soon to sail out over the measureless seas. Measureless, of course, takes us back to Song of Myself 46. By the way, we're going to get back to this with Passage to India in Spain, so just kind of put that there at, three, at, uh, at, th uh, at 3A, because we're going to come back to it for sure. So, soon to sail out over the measureless seas on the soul's voyage. And of course, the voyage here makes us immediately think of our Homer, who Whitman loved, and obviously the Odyssey, and the idea that we're always going on that voyage, and education is about that. Then, three rhetorical questions to ask. What is it that you look at when you look at a school, when you drive past a school? Whitman is going to say, is all you see a lot of boys and girls? Or only the tiresome spelling, writing, ciphering classes? You'll remember that in passage 6 of, of uh, Song of the Open Road, he says that wisdom cannot be taught in the schools, right? And we'll come back maybe to that set of lines here at the end. Only a public school, right? By the way, the, word pub, the phrase public school gets used one time in Lisa Grass and it's right here. Only a public school, and then he uses that ah that we've seen before. Ah, more infinitely more. And then interestingly in parenthetics, he jumps from schools to religion. 
to churches and to George Fox, the great Quaker thinker, the uh, Friends thinker, raised his warning cry. I think it's a powerful use of this warning cry. And then, by the way, I'll let you try and run this source to ground. It's very difficult. Scholars have spent time trying to find where this source actually came from. It might have been something that he just heard. Is this... Is it this pile of brick and mortar, these dead floors, interesting adjective, dead floors, windows, rails, you call the church? Why? This is not the church at all. The church is living, ever living souls. This is his view of uh, religion. This is his view of education. And of course, this is his view of America, which is why he moves then to the next line. And you, America. By the way, this is the 64th time that America, or some version of it, has been used in Leaves of Grass. The 92 times in all Leaves of Grass the word America gets used. And as I said to you when we met, I hear America singing. When Whitman uses this word, it's in a very particular way always, right? And you, America, cast you the real reckoning for your present. By the way, this word reckoning we'll come back to a passage to India 8. In other words, do you really want to have this conversation about the present? And then, very much using Plato's Republic 7, the lights and shadows of your future, good or evil. In other words, do you want, notice he starts with the present and he goes to the future. Do you really want to know what is at the heart of America? What is it that will allow Whitman asks for America to be successful? And in his final line, to girlhood, boyhood, look the teacher, and the school, which is, of course, taking us... I mean, think about how brilliantly Republic 7, and again, we've given a full lecture on Republic 7 in the cave allegory, and the idea that being dragged out into the light of the sun is Plato's pedagogy, and it always involves, what did we say, some fear and pain, no question about that. The idea that my son Michael learned how to ride his bike without his training wheels by overcoming fear and pain. Why? Because he knew he was going to fall, and yet, so valuable to the future of America for, for Whitman. In other words, you want to talk about the future of a, of a civilization, talk about what happens in their schools. Because when you drive past a public school, what you're driving past is, of course, America. That's his point. That is America. That's where it starts. That's where it ends. Fascinating idea. Which, of course, takes us to 2A. The future of any democracy is always about schools, as he says it, the, the teachers and the schools. At 2B, I love the power of the rhetorical question here. I love his referencing, and he doesn't do it hardly ever in Lisa Grass, quoting an outside source in the, in the course of, in the case of Fox. At 3A, and there's so many places I could go, obviously within Leaves of Grass, but at 3A, I want to just mention a book which is now probably not read anymore because of it, it's, it's lost the, the, his, the historical nature of the book and the immediacy of the book, The Dalai Lama's Ethics for the New Millennium, published in 1999. In my own professional career, if I can step aside to speak of it this way, this book probably had more influence in my thinking about education than almost any book that I've read in the last 20 years. Why? What does he say there? Well, he says two important things. One, he says young people in the 21st century will increasingly not derive their set of morals and values from religion. They will increasingly challenge the very idea of religion as a source for them of values and morals. One of the most religious men on the planet said that in this book. But number two, the thing he said was, of all the people who will, adults, who will be helping young people find their way to values and morals, it will be the teacher that matters the most. And he calls out teachers, he calls all of us as teachers out to say, you have a moral obligation to help students find their way to the ethics, to the morals that they will be practicing in their lives as they begin to raise their own children someday. Compelling, compelling idea. I love as well, just to be reminded, of what Whitman says in Song of the Open Road, Passage 6. He says it this way, Here is the test of wisdom. Wisdom is not finally tested in schools. Wisdom cannot be passed from one having it to another, not having it, wisdom is of the soul, is not susceptible of proof, is its own proof, applies to all stages and objects and qualities, and is content, is the certainty of the reality and immortality of things and the excellence of things, something there is in the flow to the sight of things that provokes it out of the soul. Now I re-examine philosophies and religions. They may prove well in lecture hall rooms, yet not prove at all under the spacious clouds and along the landscape and flowing currents. I love this idea that he will share in this little short poem, uh, Old Man's Thought of School, that 
we have to constantly ask, what is the point of putting a bunch of children together with a teacher in front of them or among them or sometimes behind them, motivating them? And as we've commented elsewhere at LearnStrong.net, I think all great teachers three, do three important D things, and Whitman certainly will play this game so often. Certainly teachers are distributors of knowledge, no question, but they're also developers, right? They develop temperament. They help develop personality, a word that Whitman loves. But finally, teachers are also destroyers. That is to say, destroying ideas, destroying the need for them, as Passage 47, A Song of Myself, suggests. I think all of that is buried as well in this little short beautiful poem. Why does it end up in autumn rivulets? Well, of course, we're always as teachers working from the old autumn to the new with students' rivulets. Beautiful. Finally at 3B, what's your view of public schools? What's your view of teachers and their value? Um, and do you think Whitman is in many ways challenging your view of schools and learning? In the end, are you prepared to begin to think of Lisa Grass as a text about teaching and learning? I hope that you are. Thank you.